Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about this new international systems policy from Canada. Just quickly about the background. I mean, this uh, the the Liberal government came in uh, to power in 2015, and you probably all remember the answer from our Prime Minister when he was asked why his cabinet was 50-50, 50% women and 50% men, and the answer was candidly because we are in 2015. The, there was uh, at the time it was a signal that was not necessarily interpreted by everybody as a political uh, agenda and, and a direction in everything that this government is doing. So when 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 came the time to restart or rethink the international assistance policy uh, that was released um, this summer uh, in June, um, we did not expect to be that feminist, and yet. Uh, uh, the, the the policy was a kind of so it took about nine months uh, to go through the consultative process towards developing the new policy. We had uh, contributions from 65 countries, 15,000 people, 10,000 uh, written contributions, and quite frankly, it was overwhelming. So the big takeaways and, and the what we heard document is available on our website. Please take the time to scan through. The big takeaways is that uh, human rights-based and inclusive approaches are key uh, and need to be kind of embedded in the way we do international development. The promotion of uh, women's and girls' rights in all their diversity is recognized in the multiple dimensions and intersecting dimensions of discrimination and marginalization based on race, ethnicity, religion, language, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, ability um, to engage in economic and social activity was kind of the, um, the big uh, takeaway from that, that consultation. And we needed to address that uh, development gap between men and women in the majority of societies of the, of the South. We also learned that we had to be very strategic in the way we direct our aid and make sure that we maximize the impact out of that. So the next slide uh, speaks about uh, how do we achieve such an agenda? And the policy is suggesting that the focus should be on gender equality and women empowerment as the most effective way to reduce poverty and build a more inclusive, peaceful, and prosperous world. The, in order to make it enshrined into the way we do things, uh, Canada, uh, Canada's new policy uh, stipulates that every effort that we put forward should be a contributor to SDG 5, and then SDG 5 should be the entry point for all other SDGs and should be um, the driver for all other SDGs. So in terms of uh, high-level commitment, 95% of our Canada's bilateral international assistance money will go to initiatives that highly or significantly um, um, in, in, in include a, a woman empowerment component, if not exclusively a woman, a woman empowerment. Actually, there is a sub-commitment of 15% that says that 15% of our aid should go exclusively to women empowerment initiatives. On the next slide, you have the six action areas of the, of the policy. And the first one, which is gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, is the core action area. What it means technically is that there is no initiative that will be uh, supported through our international system policy if it doesn't have that specific results in a specific initiative or a policy or a support of any sort. Inclusive governance speaks to a full fledged set of women's political participation, and that includes all institutions at the local, regional, and national regional levels. 
the role of women in uh, peace building uh, and, and granting long-term security and prosperity is also an area where we are exploring some action with women and women groups. The next slide speaks to the the core uh, the core action area, uh, and this one is probably uh, one of the most important ones where agriculture can play a leading role. Again, the core action area of the of, of the FIAP means that uh, in all our work, we will try to go catch one of these uh, sub objectives, I would say, or sub-outcomes of the policy. So we do have a few entry points that are listed in the policy, so we have a policy expectation. And there is the entire area of addressing sexual and gender-based violence, So, and that includes the harmful practices, uh, social and, 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 and uh, cultural norms. Uh, female genital mutilation, cuts, uh, child early forced marriage. These are uh, key elements for, for the Canadian public, and they're very sensitive to that. Supporting organizations and actions, initiatives that advance women's rights. This is an area where agriculture is by far one of the most uh, promising, simply because uh, in LDCs, for instance, you have what about 80% of women declaring agriculture as their primary source of revenue. So therefore, this is an action area where agriculture can play a role. Institutional capacity, uh, whether public, private, or creating that connection between the two, the partnership between public and private, and make it speak to women's uh, rights and women's uh, potential for supporting the development agenda is key. And here again, agriculture can play that role. And probably something that we didn't pay attention to over the years is the, the evidence base. Um, we have been uh, ticking that box of uh, gender empowerment in our programming. And we have never really taken the time to build a strong base of evidence. And evidence is not, all, is not only data, it's also practices and, and, and approaches and methodologies that work better for women and that grant maximum results for them. This is an area where we are uh, uh, planning on investing uh, towards generating this evidence base to support a feminist agenda. The next slide speaks to um, the environment and, and climate action. The, the policy recognizes that climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our time and is clearly affecting uh, women uh, in, in, in disproportionate way women and girls uh, and, and youth as well. All the youth is moving north, uh, using to, trying to use that as a skip away. But we're mindful that this is not a solution and therefore we need to develop this local capacity and local solutions. So agriculture in this area is also a key component and we're working towards developing uh, a set of um, strategic investments Obviously, at, at this stage, we are exploring a number of options and opportunities to maximize climate adaptation throughout the agriculture sector, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where the impact is much higher than the other regions. But here again, the entry point is also women. So the intent is to look at women's leadership and decision making in the areas of climate resilience uh, and adaptation efforts, how we can position women to become the leaders of that, of that change, transformational change. Resilience building, women are at the heart of communities and, and they are the ones really suffering and facing the drought episodes, the hurricanes, and therefore there is a role for women in this area. Climate policy programming, uh, here again we do have a few commitments that we have made and there is uh, a call from the policy to factor in the way to increase women's, in, in, women's access, influence, uh, control and decision making over these uh, opportunities. So you have the entire barriers to women greater access and control over resources in this area. 
This area will probably generate the most important investment in the next few years, and there is an opportunity to advance women's agenda. And uh, finally, one of the the next the next slide will speak to the the inclusive growth component. The the third uh, action area where we believe agriculture is a strong component, and it will be uh, just to give you a sense of where we are now. Under the growth component of Agriculture Canada's portfolio, 50% of that, if not more, is agriculture. And therefore, uh, we see uh, that inclusive growth continue to play a leading role uh, in our policy and serve as a vehicle for advancing women's rights, especially economic rights. So the increase in the leadership in, of women at all levels of the economic sphere especially in agriculture is an entry point for us that is valuable. We are working with a number of partners, and some of them are online here, to try to define what is the best investment, uh, uh, what, what is the best return for the buck, actually, to maximize that uh, growth agenda while advancing the SDG 5 agenda. The, the, the inclusive growth uh, agenda that we have in mind, at least what we have in the policy and what the policy is asking us to consider, is really to increase leadership of women at all levels, uh, increase the economic opportunities for women, especially developing the resilience of women and women-led communities. The intent here is really to maximize the growth agenda, which is the what, but do it the right way, uh, using women as the leaders of that development agenda. Um, the financial and the business services offer along the value chain a great opportunity to scale up the role of women in these value chains. Uh, we had great contributions actually last week at a workshop we organized here, and uh, one of the takeaways is uh, if you want women really to thrive through the economic sector or the economic agenda, uh, you better try to create additional opportunities. So make the pie bigger. And of course, we not only need to make the pie bigger, but we need to be uh, mindful of the environmental and the climate change challenges. And therefore, there's a new set of economy, a whole new set of econ economic opportunities to be driven by women. And again, uh, we are uh, looking at maximizing uh, the role of women along the value chain. But the intent is not to tick boxes along the segments of the value chain. The intent is to see how we can develop systemic uh, transformation or generate systemic transformation that will allow women to take part to these development efforts and be the leader as men in driving some of these segments at least. You have the whole unpaid work and disproportionate burden of care. Uh, these are areas where the policy is willing to engage with governments, um, organizations, whether regional or national and centers of excellence for as a mean to develop the kind of policies that will support or promote the use of socially acceptable norms or advance the socially acceptable norms. Uh, these are also action areas where we do have uh, a few opportunities. Um, the fact is that within the new setting of the policy, the humanitarian action, the food assistance, and the nutrition stand now with, with human dignity, which is another action area. And we're looking towards um, how to build that bridge between the economic growth, the climate change, the women empowerment, and the nutrition agriculture. So uh, we will provide updates as we go along in the next few weeks and months. Uh, we, do have a few, we do have a few commitments in the policy. The biggest one is really the 95% of gender inclusion or gender empowerment. So every initiative that we have will not be will will be either significantly gender inclusive or exclusively gender empowered. Uh, we do have, which means that 95% of our close to five billion development assistance envelope. Uh, we have the 2.6 billion of, on climate finance, uh, and that includes the adaptation and, and, and the mitigation side. We're trying to maximize the adaptation side on the ag side. 
we do have also the role of uh, local organizations and it's probably an, an important piece of the puzzle because without that capacity locally it will be difficult to advance a feminist agenda and uh, finally uh, we we would like to maybe emphasize the fact that agriculture will represent I mean sub-Saharan Africa will represent 50 percent of the bilateral aid and therefore uh, there is room for agriculture in the new policy <laughs>